Recently, I challenged myself to go through Minecraft's extensive list of magic mods and complete as many as I can. In the last chapter, I gathered supplies, built a home, and even found companionship. Now, a few moons have passed since I settled on this ridge, and it was time for this story to truly begin. I no longer wanted to be an occupant of this world, but rather a professor of its origins, its secrets, and obviously, its magic. So today, I tell you the story of the first mod I mastered, one with many years of development under its belt, extensive roots in the Minecraft community, and plenty of lore to explore both in-game and real life. Whether you're returning or new, hello, I'm Sniff, and welcome to Mastering Magic, Chapter 2, Botanical Pursuits. Our tale of magic resumes where we last let off. My dragon had just hatched from its egg and I completed the exterior of my home. Unfortunately, I did end my previous episode just as I was sorting my chests and I still had to do that. However, it gave me ample time to plot in my head just how I wanted to tackle mastering today's mod, Botania. You see, while I am a magic oriented fellow, Botania classifies itself as a tech mod themed around natural magic, which sounds like a confusing sentence, but I actually think it fits the mod's druidic themes very well. Although Batania calls its magic practitioners botanists, it's hard to ignore the connections this mod has to real life druidry. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of primary sources regarding ancient druidry. However, the very little sources we have attributed their fields of authority to science, religion, and cultural matters. In many ways, they blended their own technology and magic. Batania continues to push these themes into its design philosophy. Unlike other tech mods or even magic mods, it features no pipes, no GUIs, no numbers, and a deep value for its natural aesthetic. The Lexica Batania is the only written information you receive, or guide, and everything else is visual. And again, I feel the need to connect this to ancient druidry as they supposedly exchange their information orally and perhaps visually instead of documenting. So anyways, you might be wondering with all this information, what do I classify as mastering this magic or tech? Well, the base mod of Batania contains a total of 33 achievements that I thought would be an excellent measure of success. Along with that, I'm throwing in some additional challenges for myself and exploring the connections Batania has to our own world. While I don't intend for this record of mastery to be a guide, I'll try to explain things along the way so that those unfamiliar with the mod can understand the processes and choices that I make. After all, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Anyways, now that we've established our goal, let's get back to my favorite thing in the world, chess sorting. I need to make a quick trip down to the mine since I required diamond and gold to upgrade my chest. While down there, I found more skulk ridden areas, gained a few levels, and by the time I came back, it occurred to me that I could also just use storage drawers. For those not well versed with storage drawers, each drawer can only hold one type of item but a large quantity of it. This one paired with a deposit upgrade on a backpack can make sorting a million times easier. And as a bonus, I'd be able to spare a few diamonds and gold ingots. After about three-ish hours, I had some semi-sorted chests, which meant it was time to get to work. The first two achievements are obtaining a lexica batania and some mystical flowers. You can usually find the lexicon in dungeon chests, or you can craft it by combining a tree and a book. I've got a book, I've got a stick, and I think I'm just supposed to... Ta-da! Of course you could just opt to make it in game too, that, that works. But I, on a whim, decided to bind a physical copy of the lexica batania because, well, and, uh, admittedly I just thought it would be funny to spent 11 hours on this for a 30 second bit, just to show you how much content this book has. The lexicon will be essential in our botanical journey as it acts as a complete guide for everything this mod has to offer and gives great insight on some of the lore and storytelling within its design. I truly love this guide as to me it reads like a sassy wizard who decided to document his findings, which is another reason I wanted to make a physical copy for my library. This plus the achievement I got for collecting mystical flowers last episode already had me off to a great start. To completely shave off that first row of achievements, I crafted a Calcophonium and opened my Lexica Batania to read its entry. The Cacophonium is an instrument that can mimic living beings' cries, allowing a musician to play sounds of nature at will. Right-clicking with it on an entity saves the sounds it can emit into the Cacophonium. Holding right-click then will play back those sounds. Why anyone would ever want to use this contraption, however, is beyond moral comprehension. 
great. I had already completed four out of 33 achievements, I think, which meant that this was going to be easy, right? <laughs> Let me just look at the other achievements. Uh, crafting some armor, eh, that's not bad. Uh, making some flowers, easy. Creating a giant enchanting setup, okay. Um, opening a portal to another dimension, summoning the guardian of mother nature herself, <laughs> capturing air from the end, earning wings from an ancient race, and building a nuclear mana bomb. What? Upon inspecting the achievements, I realized I was probably going to want a dedicated workspace before I actually got into the thick of this mod. A more traditional druid or botanist might prefer a lovely grove, however, in the spirit of matching my house and protecting the contents of my studies, I will be constructing a greenhouse. Nighty night, me lovelies! I'll admit I'm kind of obsessed with greenhouses. Uh, perhaps it's my large hatred for bugs or the comforting warmth I feel inside them, but if I find an excuse to build one, I'll take it. I started landscaping around my house in order to create space for the building. For some reason, I decided I wanted to terraform this mountain, creating a dramatic layered landscape. It was very reminiscent of a Terrence rock garden. Ahem. <laughs> uh... I meant terraces, which I felt fit the Tudor-styled home I originally built. Speaking of Tudor, I was pleasantly surprised to learn that Tudor-styled greenhouses have a very distinctive look, typically with a masonry base, wood beams, and a satisfying 45-degree roof. Wow! Most of the examples I saw were either small or attached to the house, so I was going to need to take some liberties while applying the style to a larger building. I started with a stone brick foundation, playing around with the layout until I was satisfied with the building's footprint. I nestled it against multiple layers of the garden so that the greenhouse would have multiple entrances for easy access around the property. For the wood type, I settled on dark oak, which, thanks to some tree essence from mystical agriculture, I had plenty of. For many reasons, this made for the perfect material. For oak trees were seen as significant in many Indo-European cultures, and especially to the Celtic Druids. It is even speculated that the word Druid could have come from the Celtic word meaning knower of the oak tree. The plant is loved for its strength and durability, and interestingly enough went from being favored by the Druids in their groves to the core of the timber Tudor style I take inspiration from now. Of course, I could have used regular oak wood, but I just love dark oak so much, and recently through Minecraft's Block of the Week articles, I learned that the closest we have to dark oak is the Eastern Black Oak, which is conveniently native to the eastern side of the United States which just so happens to be where I live. It's small details like this that I truly love about building, because what may look like just a regular greenhouse can be a reference to hundreds of years of culture and a reminder of my real home. Continuing on for the windows, I used Creed's copycat panels and some various glass blocks to get a unique framing pattern. And last for the roof, I used Macaw's attic windows, opening a few to let in the fresh air. One evening, while I was hard at work on the greenhouse, I heard a swoosh above my head and was pleasantly surprised to see that my dragon was taking his very first flight. He had hatched what it felt like a few days ago and was growing at a phenomenal rate. Finally, he was old enough for me to interact with him, see his hunger, age, and give him armor. After some consideration, I decided to go with the name Winnie for the dragon, as a nickname for winter. I happily accepted Winnie's company while I built the greenhouse and continued to work every single day until the outside was complete. Once I finally got to the inside, I had a wonderful idea to build a tunnel leading from my chest room to the greenhouse so that I could grab supplies without climbing up and down 10 flights of stairs. It was certainly not the fanciest tunnel, and I only decorated it with some slightly nicer stone, but it served an excellent purpose and made transportation of supplies to the greenhouse swift. And who doesn't love a good wizardy tunnel? Before I continued on, I decided to quickly craft Winnie some armor, since I was concerned about him being attacked while I was building. I also gathered and prepared the dragon meal he needed. Apparently, each meal adds an extra day of growth, leading to Winnie growing before my very eyes. In a rush of excitement, he took to the sky. He was so excited, in fact, that I ended up having to craft a dragon flute so that I could get him to settle back down. It was here as I approached him that I noticed Winnie could carry me now. I'd never flown on a dragon before, so it was surely an exhilarating experience to just be lifted into the sky. I'll also add that it was a gorgeous view. As Winnie flew me around the lake, I watched the sunset and auroras bloom across the sky. I was quite proud of my boy who had grown so quickly and was definitely growing dangerously attached. The next day, I got back to the finishing touches of the greenhouse. In order to get started on Botania, I was going to need to cultivate a good number of flowers. You see, Botania has a lot of flowers to its name, most of which are crafted through runes and magic, but ultimately it all begins with the small petals picked from the mystical flowers in the wild. As the lexicon states, Around the world you may stumble upon a large variety of mystical flowers. Spotting these flowers doesn't take much work, as they glow faintly and sparkle. They come in a total of 16 different colors. These flowers can be plucked for mystical petals, which are used in the creation of magical instruments and plants. 
Right-clicking a petal upon the ground will bury it, making it emit particles. I had collected a few, but not all of the colors available. So in the meanwhile, I set up what flowers I could into botany pots to grow and collect over time. And I ventured out into the wild with Winnie in search of more. With my limited knowledge on dragons, I was completely unaware of Winnie's stamina limits. Not long after we set out, we were forced to meet the ground and rest. This happened well after the sunset, and I found myself in a forest shrouded in darkness. Using my bow, I felled some of the surrounding creatures, but while my back was turned, another dragon swooped in, taking the opportunity to attack Winnie. I quickly pivoted my attention, focusing on the beast, finishing it off with a few arrows. Killing dragons was becoming a habit of mine by this point, which made me feel better about venturing far from my home, but not much better about the morality of it all. I decided in the morning to take Winnie home, since he clearly wasn't ready to go out with me for extended periods of time. This was really no trouble though, since it meant at least something was guarding the home while I was away. All by myself, I ventured out into the wilderness, looking for more of the mystical flowers I needed to continue with my botanical studies. I found a few and was happily continuing the search when Danny the Toasty decided to one-shot me. What was that damage, my guy? I'll admit, I was mad about dying. Again, this wasn't set in hardcore, but I mean, does anyone want to turn into a ghastly version of themselves, barely attached to this realm and floating without purpose? No. With a deep frustration, I made my way back to my grave, though I couldn't shake the cold down my spine or the feeling that I was being watched. At least, the upside is, I guess this is how I learned that I needed to die in order to get achievements on some of my more death-orientated magic fields. So, if anyone asks, this was 100% purposeful and I was just getting out of the game, and while we're on this topic, the deaths that followed when a dragon attacked me were also very purposeful and um, helpful for my research on... Um, death. Anyways, returning to our lovely flowers, I didn't get all of them, but I got enough for the majority of flower recipes. Using storage drawers, I separated my supplies into actual flowers and the petals I picked for recipes. Now I had my greenhouse, some beginning materials, and it was time to start checking off some of those achievements. By this point, I'd already made my petal apothecary, which uses water and mystical petals to craft other flora. The first flower I needed to make was a pure daisy, which required only four white petals. In reference to the pure daisy, the lexicon states, Far from being just the most basic, the pure daisy is the most important flower a botanist can have. This flower will purify any adjacent wood or stone blocks into their purified counterparts, living wood and living rock. These resources are important crafting materials throughout a botanist's career. Which certainly remains true, as living rock and living wood can be crafted into mana pools and mana spreaders respectively, the mana pool being the main way to store mana and the mana spreader being the main way to transport it. If you're confused why a flower might generate mana, then let me introduce you to Botania's entire magic system. In this mod, flowers can be separated for the most part into two categories, generating flowers and functional flowers. Generating flowers are quirky little fellas, each with their own unique source of energy that they consume and then output mana. There are many options for generating flowers in Botania, some of which require ingredients leagues out of my current experience, and some craftable with just a few colorful petals. To start my mana generation, I'll be following the lexicon's advice on generating flora. Choosing your first generating flower is a pretty simple task. The simplest two choices for any fledgling botanist are the Endoflame and the Hydroangels. The former uses coal or other fuel sources to generate mana, the latter uses water sources for the same task, but decays after about three days. I started by creating the Hydrangeas first, and a mana pool to collect their output. By doing this, I completed an additional two achievements, leaving me out of six out of 33. Next, I got started on my Endo Flames. Costing a few more petals, these flowers produce three times as much mana in comparison to the Hydrangeas. The only downside being that they need to be fed, making them not passive and less automated. I crafted a few and chucked some coal at them, and now it was simply a matter of letting my mana supply build up. Uh, small note here, my shaders weren't exactly compatible with Botania's graphics. I did solve this later, but if you're wondering why you can't see any mana in the pools, that's why. While I waited for a supply to build up, I started decorating the inside of my house. After all, I had created this massive home last episode and left the inside completely blank. I started with an essential room, the kitchen, since lately if I wasn't working in the greenhouse, I was preparing food for Winnie and I. The shift from druid tech magic brain to builder brain was a bit jarring, but my attention issues yearned for it. For decoration, I used blocks from all kinds of mods, from Beautify to Farmer's Delight to the Let's Do series. Building in modded Minecraft to me is truly a great exploratory experience, since there's always new blocks that have me brainstorming ways to integrate them into my builds. 
By the way, if you're enjoying our journey into the shimmering depths of magic, you should consider subscribing to my Patreon. Like a king, sponsors a court wizard, you too can support our journey into the wild, whimsical, and beyond. Patreon members enjoy early access to videos and the ability to request builds. Or if you're new and you just want to be regaled with the bardic songs of my exploits, make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube. It's completely free and is the best way to stay updated with happenings across the realm. With that all out of the way, let's get back to it. After doing a little shimmy in my kitchen, I went back to working on my Botania achievements as I finally had enough mana to begin. The next achievement on my list was to create a set of mana weave robes, which is exactly what you might expect it to be, string imbued with mana, woven into fabric, then crafted into robes. These robes have the lowest damage resistance out of all of the Botania armor sets, but have interesting qualities. Wearing the full set of mana weave robes also grants the wearer an increased proficiency with magical rods, increasing their powers and or ranges. Mana weave robes can use mana from one's inventory to repair themselves, similarly to mana steel armor, but at a lower mana cost. They certainly could be useful, however, since I don't have any tools yet and I had armor already, I decided to just craft the robes, get the achievement, and put them up for display in my greenhouse. Now, I was once again back to painstakingly waiting for my mana to generate, and I decided to use the time to do some mining, since I was going to need a lot of diamonds and iron for this mod. In favor of not using the durability on my nice pickaxe, I crafted a throwaway one and enchanted it with Vein Miner. It was really only to tunnel through the deep slate while I used my better pick to mine the goodies. I spent about an hour down there, completely clearing out a lava river and finding a few dungeons. My mining trip turned out to be a great success, as I came back with plenty of diamonds and iron. Upon arriving home, I checked a diamond in the mana pool, creating my first mana diamond. Diamond. This would be used to craft a runic altar, another fun component of Batania's crafting system. With this, I could create one of the 16 runes of Batania, which are used as ingredients in complex flowers or devices. These runes are separated into three tiers. According to the lexicon, The most elementary runes are named after the four elements, the intermediate runes are named after the four seasons, and the most advanced runes are named after the seven deadly sins. A separate rune of mana also exists outside this progression. In this realm and in Batania, runes are symbols carved into rounded stones infused with the essence of their ingredients, but runes are far from fiction in our own world. The word rune itself has many definitions, but it's most commonly attributed to a script for ancient Germanic languages, which evolved into many languages including German, English, Yiddish, and many of the languages spoken in Scandinavian countries. The oldest set of runes, and probably the one that inspired Botania's symbols, is Elder Futhark, named for the first six letters in its alphabet, its sharp and angular symbols made it easy to be carved into rock and wood. These symbols were culturally seen as a gift and used for omens, protections, and predictions. Though the concept of runic magic really started to take off in the medieval ages through songs and stories about curses and enchantments placed upon people through runes. Nowadays, it has become a clear inspiration for fantasy-inspired media, especially ones that derive from Scandinavian culture. An obvious example would be Skyrim and its fictional dragon runes. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry, you're telling me they had a perfectly good ancient Norse alphabet to draw from for their Norse-inspired fantasy and they chose something from halfway across the world? I mean, cuneiform is amazing, but when I catch you, Dot Howard! Of course, Botania has me doing all the carving and not Winnie, and a lot of carving I'd need to do. Since in this magical realm, I required at least all four <laughs> elemental runes in the mana rune to continue with my botanical studies. While there was no individual achievement for making these, runes are a fundamental aspect of crafting in this mod and related to plenty of upcoming achievements. So I started with the water rune. I had nearly every ingredient with the exception of sugarcane, so I hopped away to the nearest riverbed and gathered some up. Also, I kind of randomly fell into a mossy mine shaft, but it was worth it for the random loot that I probably put in a chest and forgot about. Back in the greenhouse, I set the ingredients on the altar and with a little bit of mana it all started to come together. This is where I feel I must add how much I adore the visuals of Batania, the rush of excitement I felt the first time I ever crafted a rune and saw the electricity coming from the altar is very dear to me. For the next rune I focused on fire. Unfortunately this one required some ingredients from the dreaded underworld aka the nether. Truth be told I had not even built a portal yet. As a result I acquired some obsidian and chose a temporary spot for the portal. Then I prepared for my journey. With some empty inventory space and some food I ventured into the portal, praying I would have a semi-decent spawn location. Alas, when I did come out on the other side of the portal, I was faced with another biome like no other I'd seen before. Still eerie and desolate, yet refreshing. Upon observing the surroundings of my portal, I noticed a waystone. Was this... 
coincidence? I knew of such stones usually reserved for structures and villages, but to find one in the middle of nowhere was strange. I broke the waystone and replaced it to rename the location in my own language. I figured it was best to leave it where it was in case I came across another. Distractions now aside, I continued my search for nether wart and nether bricks. A little way from the portal, I came upon an odd house built with warped wood and quartz. It contained a few skeletons, which I easily killed, and to my luck, I discovered some nether wart growing in the gardens. I was thankful considering this meant I didn't need to search for another fortress just yet. After collecting some nether bricks from netherrack, my trip was officially a success, and I went home to craft the fire rune. For the next two runes, earth and air, I already had the required ingredients which made their creation a breeze. Lastly, I created the mana rune, made of mana steel and a mana pearl. These two items are very typical crafting ingredients in Batania, made by infusing mana into iron and ender pearls respectively, kind of like the mana diamond. With these five runes complete, not only was I able to craft the next tier, but I could create a terrestrial ter ter <laughs> Oh my god. A, a ter ter terrorist Trial agglomeration plate. <laughs> I'm just gonna call it a TA plate. I'm sorry. This silly blue plate plays an important role in the create. <laughs> I can't stop laughing at myself. This silly blue plate plays an important role in the creation of one of Batania's most valuable resources, Terra Steel. Terra Steel is a complex and useful magical alloy infused with ridiculous amounts of mana. Synthesizing it proves to be no small task. For starters, its creation requires a terrestrial agglomeration plate placed over a checkerboard pattern of lapis lazuli blocks and living rock, or shimmer rock. This block then needs to be provided with mana, with sparks being the most efficient mode of transfer. Acquiring Terra Steel would now become my main focus, along with completing this row of achievements, and luckily for me, they both aligned in the goal of creating a spark. Sparks are, well, Sparks, adorable little flickers of light used to transport large quantities of mana in a short period of time. What really separates them from mana sputters is that they only take from mana pools and give to hyper-specific blocks. Unfortunately, to craft this thing, I was going to need blaze powder, which meant my time in the nether was far from over. Begrudgingly, I ventured back through the portal, mostly in search of another fortress or just anywhere where blazes spawned, which I could not seem to find. What I did find, though, was this very interesting structure. It was almost cathedral-like in appearance, towering high and to the sky with an aurora of energy that fatigued me and took away my ability to break any blocks. Not only that, but it was occupied, predominantly by illagers. Hypothetically, I knew I could walk away and continue my search for a true nether fortress, but the curiosity of what laid inside burned through me like the flames of the nether itself, and I found myself exploring the grounds without a second thought. As for the illagers, I started clearing them out with my bow until I entered the main hall where over a dozen of them gathered. I tried my best to find cover and peek out to shoot them, but my arrow supply ran low and soon I had to fight them up close. That wasn't the only dwindling supply either. As I checked my pack for food to heal up, I realized I entered this fight without more than a few stakes. With my health low and my advantage of distance gone, I did what I knew best. Ran. I stumbled into one of the towers, finding a room with considerably less illagers but one annoying vex. Did you see it? On the left side of the doorframe, barely visible on camera. After dealing with it, I sat and tried to think of my options for getting out of this situation. In haste, I searched the crates to find amethyst shards, and suddenly I had an idea. With some ender pearls from my bag and a diamond, I crafted a warp stone, which I was then able to make into a waystone. This connected back to the one I had discovered near the portal, and I could escape my unfortunate circumstances. I will add, this is like the one moment where I can truly say there are advantages to not clearing out your backpack. Once back at home, I found myself frustrated with the lack of food. I had previously set up a garden, but it got destroyed when I built my home, and most of the meat I'd been fetching went on to become Winnie's breakfast. So it was time to flex my druidic magic in a different way, that being mystical agriculture. Now listen, I'm a pretty big fan of plant-based meat, but mystical agriculture takes it to a whole new level. By capturing the souls or essences of mobs, I could ritualistically infuse them into seeds and farm that essence. But to do this, I was going to need a lot of organic material from that mob. In this case, I chose pigs. So with some soul stuff I collected from the nether, I built a soul extracting machine and some jars to store my pig essence. Now all I needed to do was collect the pork that I would extract the pig soul from. Originally, I intended to discuss Botania's connection Connection to ancient slash modern druidry and paganism. However, as silly as it is, I think mystical agriculture ironically matches up to animism. 
For those who have never heard this word before, animism is the belief that all natural things can hold some kind of soul or spirit. It's certainly broad and depends from person to person. For some, it can be a true belief, and for some, it can be a form of mindfulness for the space and being surrounding us. It's believed that ancient druids and Celtics held some animistic beliefs, especially in terms of reincarnation, that the soul or spirit continues on. The Romans attributed this belief to the ancient Celts' courage in life and on the battlefield. Julius Caesar himself observed, they wish to inculcate this as one of their leading tenets, that souls do not become extinct, but pass after death from one body to another, and they think that men, by this tenet, are in a great degree excited to valor, the fear of death being disregarded. In recent years, though, a study conducted globally of 725 identified druids showed that 64% believed in animism to a degree, so it's certainly not a dead or ancient belief by any means, and it has presence in plenty of other cultures, media, and apparently Minecraft mods? In Botania, I think mana is the closest thing to spirit, pure, natural energy, whereas mystical agriculture is more literal and silly. I'm sure when people thought of souls and spirits back then, they certainly weren't envisioning capturing them in jars and ritualistically infusing them into seeds, but here we are, I guess. So after killing dozens of pigs, I set out to make my meat growing seeds. I could only craft a single seed, unfortunately, but hopefully I would cultivate more. I planted it in a pot in the greenhouse, and now all I had to do was let it grow. That solved the problem of a very hungry dragon in the future, but in the meanwhile for myself, I whipped up some baked potatoes for my trip back to the nether. With considerably more space in my inventory, I used the waystone to travel back to the Illager Fort and continue to slay my way through it. Of course, because this world truly loves irony, I immediately found a room full of food and I was like, well, that just kind of made the past two hours less than necessary, but it's fine. I found some fun stuff like a totem of undying, some gold blocks, and I met a little fire goblin too. Sadly, I did not find a blaze, blaze rods, or blaze powder, but since my inventory was full yet again, I went home. Winnie greeted me with a little dance of excitement and I unloaded my backpack into my chest. You may notice that these are unlabeled and unorganized despite my claim to an organized chest room and to that I say y'all I am trying my best but I am a creature of habit. I checked in on my pork plant and found it was growing well. I collected the crop and fried myself up some bacon for my next trip down to the nether. After all, I still needed blaze rods. I arrived back at the Illager Fort and broke the waystone to take with me where I please for easy transport back to the portal. Before I left this place though, I checked the basement and to my surprise found a bunch of loot that I missed. There was also a maze, which totally wasn't suspicious at all. No, 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 I certainly did not read it as totally innocent. Come across a sword, steal it, and face the consequences for my actions. After nearly burning to a crisp, I decided I was done with this place and I wandered out so that I could find a real nether fortress. I walked the flat, soul-ridden underworld in search of either a blaze or a fortress. Often though, I was disappointed by the sad nether brick cube houses, although one did contain some notable treasure. In the chest was this strange relic that repelled fire from blazes, which I'm sure would be helpful when I could actually find some blazes, if I could. I kept wandering upon microstructures, mobs, and eventually a bastion. For a moment, I considered passing it up to continue my blaze hunt, but the prospect of netherite scrap had me intrigued, so it was time for another detour. As per usual, I focused on sniping the piglins and avoiding up-close combat. When I cleared out about half of it, I decided to do another supply run home to cook myself more food and to drop off loot. By this point, I was getting very irked by the lack of blazes. After all, I wanted to spend time in my beautiful greenhouse, not the depths of hell. After a great deal of adventuring around the nether, I wandered into this desert-like biome with steep sandy hills. To my surprise, there was blazes everywhere, and I felt ecstatic. I fought a few, eager for blaze rods, and then another few, and then another few, and something was wrong. I had killed over a dozen blazes, and not one of them dropped a blaze rod. It was then that I noticed that these blazes were labeled as desert blazes. And I still have no idea if that made a difference, but it sure felt like it did. So I was back to searching for an authentic nether fortress. It would only be hundreds of blocks later when I finally stumbled upon a nether fortress. By then, I was tired and worn down, but the immediate sight of a real blaze invigorated me like nothing before. After I'd killed a few, I left the spawner for future blaze hunting, and then I went looting some of the chests. After all, I felt like I needed an actual reward for all these efforts. 
months. Finally satisfied with my time in the nether, I placed down my extra waypoint and traveled back to the portal to finally continue with Batania. First, it was time to up my mana generating game. I didn't feel like creating and replacing Hydra Rangers anymore, and I didn't want to keep manually feeding my endo flames either. So I crafted a hovering hourglass, one of my favorite redstone tools in Batania. It's simply just a timer that emits a redstone signal every time it flips, and you can get detailed with your sand settings. My plan was to connect it to a few droppers and semi-automate fueling my endo flames. Now to both my redstone and Batania enjoyers, I hope you're prepared to laugh because I made several mistakes when I first set this up. For starters, I built two timers, which was completely unnecessary considering I could have just extended the signal, and two, I put coal blocks in my droppers, and then set a timer that was meant for a single piece of charcoal. It was a rookie mistake, but one I would not realize until I went to sort my chests, came back and found my coal blocks gone, and very little mana to show for it. I didn't make this mistake again since I just started putting charcoal in the droppers, which worked fine for the timer I set, and this resource was more plentiful considering the abundance of wood I had access to. Now that that was settled, I went back to sorting while the endo flames burned through their fuel. There is a lot of waiting in Batania, but this didn't particularly bother me since it meant that I could take breaks and do mundane housework such as sorting my chests and adding details to my home. Although very similar to my real life experiences, I often started doing things and then forgot about them or got distracted. During this time, I decided to build a fireplace in the dining room, and then about halfway through I changed my mind and instead went to add more endo flames to my mono generation setup, and then I went back to the fire place, only finish one level, and then completely forgot about it. The only thing that seems consistent about my thought process is how inconsistent it is, but I digress. Now that my mono generating was becoming some serious business, I crafted an extra pool that with any luck would be full soon. To burn off some extra excitement, I made a trip back to the nether and went thoroughly through the nether fortress. When I arrived back, I crafted two sparks to connect my mana pools and my TA plate. This gave me the achievement, Live Drive, and as soon as I had the materials and the mana, the ability to create Terra Steel. That would need to wait though, as I was going to need a little bit more mana. When the lexicon said it required a ridiculous amount to assemble a terra steel ingot, it certainly wasn't joking. On top of one mana diamond, mana pearl, and mana steel ingot, I need half a mana pool. If you don't regularly dabble in Botania, that might not mean much to you, so for reference, my endo flames would need to collectively burn about 417 charcoal to fill that. 500 cigarettes. As a result, I'm stuck waiting, but that doesn't mean I plan to spend my time inefficiently. I still had a list of achievements and decided to work on what I could. Starting at the top row, I had to create and eat a biscuit of totality. To do this, I'd have to throw a cookie into my mana pool, which sounds really cool and mysterious, but then I started thinking about it a little bit more and I was like, ah yes, let me just dip my chocolate chip cookie into this blue liquid and I'll have a soggy magical biscuit. Yay? To be fair though, the cookie did give me full hunger and saturation, so it must have been a really nice soggy biscuit. Next on my achievement list was to craft an assembly halo. This is one of my favorite Batania tools and you'll soon see why. The first stage, the assembly halo, is quite easy to craft, needing only a mana pool, a crafting table, and three mana steel. The assembly halo works as a portable crafting table that allows you to store a number of recipes as well. This alone sounds lovely, but the upgrade takes it to a whole new level. The manufactory halo does all the same things, except the recipes you set for it will auto-craft if you have the ingredients in your main inventory. The most cited use for this is the compression of ores, but I'll certainly be using it for a lot more than that. Our next achievement follows the similar theme of imbuing various objects with mana, but this one is particularly silly. I wandered into my storage room and plucked a potato from my food bin. I chucked it into the mana pool and was rewarded not with a soggy blue potato, but with a tiny potato. This thing has very little function other than it just smiles, does a little dance, and you can pet it. However, he is very important to me. And his birthday is July 19th, just, you know, so everyone knows. I was cruising through the achievements at this point, so as per usual, I was bound to crash soon. When I went to craft the mana enchanter for the next achievement, I could not find a single recipe, which left me all but stumped. So I flicked open the pages of my lexicon to learn that this was in fact an intricately large multi-block structure. To create a mana enchanter, I had to first set up an obsidian wheel-like shape in the ground, then strategically place flowers all around the area, then six mana pylons along the side, and with a final click of my wand, the lapis block seemingly transformed into the enchanter I needed and I was rewarded with the achievement. Of course, now I had this giant setup and no understanding of enchanting with Batania, so I reopened my book to read the following passage. With the magical power emitted from mana pylons, a structure can be built that performs enchants with books without consuming them. The construction of a mana enchanter isn't cheap though, neither in space nor materials. 
I didn't have many useful enchanting books in my storage, but my mind immediately drifted to the benefits this could bring when I get my hands on a mending book. Though it would probably cost a great deal of mana, I could get it on all my tools and equipment with only one book. Unfortunately, this was just wishful thinking considering I had neither the book nor the surplus of mana, but at least I had an idea of how it works and how to put it to use. In the meanwhile, I decided to look into the enchanting system in Apothesis, because I had a sneaking suspicion that one could certainly benefit the other. What I learned last episode was that there were three factors that went into enchanting in this system, Eterna, Quanta, and Arcana. Eterna works in ways familiar to a regular enchanter. For every level of Eterna, two levels could be accessed at the enchanting table, meaning 15 bookshelves providing 15 Eterna could allow the player to enchant up to level 30. Quanta is a more difficult factor, affecting chance and acting as a bit of a gamble for how high the level of the enchantment actually is leaving you with the opportunity to get more bang for your buck or less. And last, there is Arcana, a factor that determines the rarity of enchantments. Each of these work in different ways with different items that impact the level of the enchanting table. However, another thing Apothesis allows you to do is go beyond that 30 level maximum of regular Minecraft. But everything comes with a cost, and in this case, I needed superior bookshelves. And so, the plan formed right before my very eyes. While my endoflames collected mana, I'd focus on building up my Apothesis enchanting setup, create books, and then use them in my Botania enchanter. And once I was done, I could return to my list of achievements with a mana supply to take from. It was perfect. So I went back to the nether to gather all kinds of materials for my superior bookcase. The next craftable tier was the Hellfire bookcase, which required six nether brick, a blaze rod, a bookshelf, and a regen potion. Now I know that I said before I thoroughly cleared out the nether fortress, but I was still finding chests I hadn't looted. In one, I actually found this really wicked sword called Ember Flame. I still preferred my halberd, but this thing was definitely going on display in my home, and suddenly it occurred to me all the different kinds of artifacts I might discover while playing in this world. Perhaps a dedicated space will be needed, and an armory perhaps? I started visualizing the- no, 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 stop it, stop it. But it, but it would be really pretty. That's just it talking. You could not take a side quest when you're already on a side quest. But okay, fine. Next episode? Next episode. After that snappy trip to the nether, I started brewing potions and crafting my Alpha Giga Chad bookcases. It was certainly a slow process and in between crafting, I had to frequently check on my flowers and make sure they were well fueled. But soon enough, I had a full set of Hellfire bookcases and my ability to enchant my tools was growing stronger and stronger. However, this was a meager upgrade at best, and I still needed more Eterna to access the enchantments I wanted. My only option to progress further from here was to infuse each bookshelf with 45 levels of my own experience. And maybe I'm just young, but that's a lot of experience. I've done a pretty good job of growing my levels naturally at this point, and it serviced me well when it came to repairing tools and such, but 45 levels a bookcase was going to be a task. I needed to think of some way to farm experience a bit better. Wait a minute. Farm? Experience. Farm? Grow? Grow experience? Surely if I could grow literal meat, I could grow experience, right? And the answer, folks, is yes, I could. It was certainly going to be an investment, though, since I was going to need to fill four jars with about 35 levels of experience each. At first, I thought I would just do this by mining. I went to the nether and chipped away looking for netherite in the process. But after seeing how little that supplied me and how much it was eating at my tools, I tried to think of other ways. And then a memory popped into my head. Last episode, I had found an ancient city not far from my underground cave. It spread out far and wide, bolstering a great deal of skulk, and therefore experience. I grabbed my jars and headed down to the ancient city. Obviously, I needed to be extremely careful, so I focused on destroying sensors and shriekers, and only once I felt safe did I go about breaking all the skulk. The experience jars filled at an abundant rate, and despite how much I hated the visceral, squishy sound of Skulk, I was having some fun. However, I still preferred not to spend too much time down here at the risk of spawning a warden, so as soon as I filled all four jars, I was out. At home, I assembled the experience seeds and replaced the pork plant with them since I definitely had enough pork for the time being. And just to get a jump start on those levels, I crafted some mystical fertilizer to grow some experience essence and a few extra seeds. What I found is that the essence goes on to be crafted into drops, which works very similarly to experience bottles. They don't give you much, but if I sit and let it grow and collect for a while, I'm sure that would change. Finally, I came to my senses and realized how far I'd trade from working on Botania, and I kind of had a little bit of a laugh about it. The experience couldn't hurt though, and neither could better enchantments, so I reminded myself in the end it's all the same. Getting back to my flowers though, I fed my endoflames and noticed my coal and charcoal supply was dwindling. 
In response, I decided to set up the classic ye old charcoal burner in my storage room, but with a little twist. Instead of a traditional furnace, I would use one upgraded through mystical agriculture, and instead of chests, I was going to be using storage drawers. Now I just needed to fill it with bundles of logs and let the furnace do the work. Finally, now, after everything, I had some time to continue with my Botania achievement hunt. This next achievement is where things get a little bit spicy. <clears throat> Not for me, of course. This was my first achievement involving crafting a flower, and it wasn't just going to be any flower. I needed to craft a polydisiac, which, um, I'm just gonna let the, the lexicon do the talking. Animals ah. love eating. That's all they seem to do, really. Strangely enough, though, they only eat things that are fed to them. The polydisiac will simply do just that. It uses mana to feed nearby food items on the ground, wheat, carrots, etc., to animals within range, putting them in better moods. For an interesting tone shift, the next achievement required me to craft a monopool and a minecart, and you guys will never guess how I made this. <sighs> I'm glad this exists, but also I don't have any intention of transporting my mana anytime soon, so this was another item I was just gonna set aside. After that, I had a more open-ended achievement to work on. It was to simply create some type of little trinket or ring. Botania has lots of bits and bobbles to choose from, some purely decorational, but most are functional. For my first trinket, I wanted to go with something practical, so I chose the magnetic ring, which causes items to drift my way. Upon crafting and donning the ring, I had completed the entire row of achievements, leaving me with 15 out of 33 completed, and I was starting to feel more comfortable exploring the areas of this mod I hadn't really touched. I decided to celebrate with a nice meal, but on my way back to the house, I noticed my beloved Winnie was getting rather large. He didn't appear that comfortable perched on the greenhouse anymore, and I started to wonder how big was this guy gonna get? According to my research, a full-grown stage 5 dragon can reach 50 blocks long, which is much larger than the little guy I once had perched on my shoulder. I thought perhaps Winnie might like his own place to be for both his sake and mine. With his growing size, the space I built for myself was no longer working for him, and so I needed to accommodate. I strolled around my house for a bit and chose a spot high in elevation to build Winnie a nest. I decided to model it after the dragon nest I seen in the wild, but with my own sort of twist. I started by mapping out a circle over 50 blocks in diameter to fit the lad and cleared the area of dirt and stone. For a sort of rustic style, I encased the circle in spruce logs of differing heights and laid out various stones for the floor. It wasn't the same as the icy nests I discovered underground, but it was more durable, practical, and purposeful. Upon completing the nest, I retrieved Winnie and flew him over to his new resting place. Already, he seemed so much more content with the ample space to land and take off. Which made me curious, what was Winnie's stamina like now? How fast could he fly? Many days had passed since we flew out that one night, and both him and I had grown so much since our last adventure. I decided to take another trip out, to explore more of the land beyond my home, and let Winnie stretch his wings. It was another tangent from Botania, I know, but perhaps I could find something useful. I packed up some rations and emptied my backpack as much as I could, and just like that we were off. This hardly compared to my first flight with Winnie. Not only did I appear now as a speck on his back, but we flew at a speed faster than my sight could process. Hours passed, and all the while I scribbled out the land below for my map. When we came across a village, I decided to land. I hadn't really been to many villages in this world, and I was curious what treasures it contained. For the most part, I found food, gems from Apothesis, and a few silly trinkets. Nothing incredibly special, but there, in the heart, I spotted a waystone just like the one I discovered in the nether. I activated it, adding it to my list, which meant I could travel back here when needed. By the time I finished looting chests and chatting with the villagers, the sun swept below the horizon into night, and I took shelter until dawn. Winnie eagerly greeted me in the morning, and we began the journey back home. There were a few creatures we encountered along the way, but nothing serious, at least until a lightning dragon began to attack Winnie mid-flight. Aerial combat was not exactly my forte, so we force landed in the woods and I began to fight back. Although Winnie was by far the larger dragon, I was deadly afraid of him getting hurt or worse dying, but it was clearly an irrational fear because the lightning dragon stood little chance against either of us. Once Winnie had cooled his nerves from the encounter, we finished the last leg of our trip and safely landed home. I followed my usual routine of emptying my pack, then checking on the Botania garden. Finally, I had a decent mana reserve built up, enough so that I could craft my first terra steel ingot. I sprinted to my chest room and grabbed the necessary materials. With much anticipation, I stood back and tossed the materials onto the TA plate. It's very important not to touch them. Once the mana starts to transfer between the sparks, it cannot be reversed. And by picking up or disturbing the materials, it can interrupt the transformation and waste your mana. So imagine my surprise when literally nothing happened. This was my mistake, as I had accidentally placed my plate too far away for the sparks to connect. After moving it over a couple blocks, I tried again and watched in awe as the mana imbued all three items into an ingot as bright as summer grass. And there I had it, my terrestrial ingot. 
It felt like such an accomplishment, but in reality, it paled to the events to come. Like everything in Botania, this is a single step in a long journey. When it comes to Terra Steel, there is a very clear intention of what you should do with your first Terra Steel ingot, as progression beyond it requires another category of botanical resources, and more importantly, another realm. Once upon a time, elves shared the world with us Minecraftians. Due to events unknown to us, they were banished back to their own world, Alfheim, never to return. Experiments have been performed in an attempt to re-establish a connection between the two worlds, and a theoretical procedure for creating such a portal has been devised. Actually creating this portal would prove an arduous task. Quite a few unusual resources would be necessary. The net requirements come down to eight living wood blocks, three glimmering living wood blocks, an elven gateway core, read on, and at least two mana pools and natura pylons, also read on. The two mana pools with natura pylons directly above them would be needed within an 11 by 11 by 11 area around the core. The initial activation of the portal, we believe, would cost a huge amount of mana from said pools, and would be performed by right-clicking the core with a wand of the forest. The portal is designed to draw mana from all pools with pylons equally. If any pool ran out, any connection a portal might have would close. Even with all these preparations, any link the portal could establish would be too weak to transfer living beings. So, an Alfheim vacation's off the table no matter what. But items might just make it through. Though, mana from the surrounding mana pools would be needed for items to survive a return trip. All knowledge about Alfheim in this lexicon is at this point, limited to what you find in this entry. It seems that elven knowledge has been almost totally lost. Perhaps if the elves could have a look at this book, they could provide further insight. So I did as I was advised, dividing the Terra Steel ingot into nine nuggets and crafting the portal frame and pylons. But before I activated it, I had to plan out accordingly. The portal itself sustains off mana, so it's preferable to me to trade things in large batches and open the portal for small amounts of time. And to plan out further, I needed to figure out what resources I wanted to trade for and what I'll need to make for the trade. For starters, I was going to need a lot of living wood, as this can be traded for dream wood, which is used to create even better mana spreaders. Next, I was going to want to get as many mana pearls as possible possible. These get traded for pixie dust, which become an essential ingredient in crafting future flowers, especially higher tier generation flowers. Last, a couple of mana diamonds, which get traded for dragonstone, and a lot of mana steel, since uh, the exchange rate isn't exactly in my favor right now. Two mana steel for every elementium ingot, a rare pink metal from Alfheim. Which sounded familiar. As we venture into the mythos of Botania, it's going to be pretty hard to ignore its connections to Old Norse mythology, poetry, and everything connected and influenced by it. Alfheim is a huge example of this, with the world being taken directly from its Old Norse inspiration. It refers to a land of elves, which in many European cultures are just a type of fae. When we think about Norse, especially Old Norse culture, it's pretty easy to mentally confine it to Scandinavia. But as we've established before, Old Norse stems from a family of cultures widespread to most of Europe, including parts of the intercontinent and the British Isles. Which is why other cultures and authors ended up establishing their own versions of Alfheim, Fairyland, Fairy, Elfheim, the list goes on. With Alfheim being mentioned in Old Norse as early as the 10th century, and others trickling in years after. But of course, that's just when it's documented. Who knows how long these stories of lands have been passed by oral tradition. Once I had my trading supplies, I realized I still needed to build up my mana, since creating the Terra Steel had taken up so much of it. Now, I was certainly starting to get tired of this waiting game, but hopefully it wouldn't be like this for much longer. In the meanwhile, I harvested levels from my experience plants and infused more of the Hellfire bookcases with my experience. By then, my mana supply was decent enough, and I went ahead with setting up the portal. Also, side note, at this point I did fix some of the rendering issues my shaders and the mod gave me, so yippee! <laughs> With sufficient mana in both pools, I right-clicked the gateway and watched as the portal opened. And with this, I received another achievement, World Calling. I wasted no time in trading, immediately throwing blocks through the portal, but I noticed I gained more than the resources I had traded for, for a page had been stuck in my Lexica Botania. It read, Greetings. We found this book when one of our old portal frames spontaneously opened a link to another world. 
quite a shock for us, indeed. On behalf of all Elven Guard, we thank you sincerely for providing us with a repository of knowledge from your world. It's been a while since we had to leave, so it's good to see that it's been doing well. After extensive discussion within the High Council of Elven Guard, we have decided to cooperate with you. You see, your lexica Botania makes references to certain resources from your world that we might be extremely keen to get our hands on. These resources are simply non-existent in our lands. The link you've established is, unfortunately, too weak to transfer living beings. This seems to be a consequence of the sheer distance between our realms. A pity. We would have liked to meet our trading partner in person. However, on the upside, the link allows us to change the synchronization of time across our worlds, which is how you will receive your book back so quickly, at least from your perspective. We're well stocked on mana and other magical energies, so worry not about the portal closing on our end. In fact, to be blunt, our offer is as follows. For the advancement of both our civilizations, we vow to provide certain resources you lack in your world. In exchange for certain resources from yours that we lack in ours. We have taken the liberty of assigning our best scribes to transcribe the bulk of the knowledge from our world into your lexicon. We hope you find it enlightening and that the knowledge encourages you to invest in our materials. Please be forewarned that if you do decide to send us an item we have not vowed to trade for, we will assume it to be a gift and keep it for ourselves. We thank you again and look forward to exchanging resources with you. Best regards, the High Council of Elven Guard. How lovely it was to establish a connection beyond such barriers. For now, I close the portal to preserve my mana and I walk back to my greenhouse with my newfound supplies. With the aid of the elves, I can now completely upgrade my mana generation. I know it sounds like that's all I talk about, but I mean, it's kind of the basis of the entire mod. And as great as end of flames are, they aren't my prime choice for mana generation. If you've watched any of my previous videos, you might have noticed my growing admiration for the create mod. I mean, I think this is pretty universal for a lot of folks, but to me, watching that one teaser was its own kind of magic. Since I saw that video, I have been yearning to mix and match Create and Botania, and what better way to do that than with the Kekamuras flower. The Kekamuras flower is basically everything I've been working towards at this point. It's a high tier mana generating flower that eats cake. To compare its performance to the Endo Flame, one Kekamuras takes about 80 cakes and 37 minutes to fill a mana pool, which is a lot faster than 8 hours. But also, 80 cakes in Minecraft is nothing to bat an eye at. If I had to make them all by hand, I'd be a baker, not a botanist. So, create cake factory it is. But hold on, um, how do I make a cake factory? Suddenly I had this realization that I had come up with this supposedly brilliant idea with very little information on how to execute it. I imagine the seasoned creator would turn to a friend for resources or watch a YouTube video, but alas, in my silly realm of magic, I have no Wi-Fi connection and my only friends are dragons and elves I've never seen. So it was up to my complete imagination and personal experimentation. Luckily for me, Create does have schematics, so I can actually play around with my design in my head, make adjustments, draft, redraft, redraft some more. Also, I'm by no means a create purist, so I was also integrating other mods and additions into the machine. After an entire day of experimentation, I settled on my design and it was time to bring it into this world. And here is where we get silly again. The way Create goes on building its schematics is honestly one of my favorite things. You literally make a cannon and it shoots the blocks into place. Yeah! 
On top of that, you get a detailed list of the supplies you need for the schematic. This to me was ideal, since I used most of my brain power on the design and needed something mundane. Also, sometimes you just need a good list to get you through the day. Thanks to my obsessive resource hoarding, I flowed down the list without much need to leave my home. Create relies on copper, bronze, and andesite alloy, which I had been saving for this very moment. There are some immersive crafting components to create that I really enjoy, such as sanding the red quartz or running an assembly line for rotational controllers. After about two hours, I completed my checklist and brought the supplies to a dugout room. Um, so yeah, this wasn't like the classiest of rooms, I won't lie, but I kind of had an understanding that at some point I'd likely move it all. Anyways, with the materials and some gunpowder, the construction began. One by one, the cannon shot the materials into place. I was mesmerized by this, and honestly, I could have watched the entire thing if my PC didn't crash just by watching it. So unfortunately, I had to leave the cannon to its own devices. In the meantime, I could craft the supplies for a boiler that would power the entire thing. For the design of the boiler, I used a design I remember learning from my civilization video. There are probably much more efficient ways to do this, but alas, I was working with the little information I knew. Finally, with everything assembled, I'd like to give you a bit of a walkthrough of the design. Cake is a dessert as old as time, with a complicated baking process that humans have well refined. It begins with a sunless wheat farm. The crop is automatically harvested when grown and milled down into a fine flour, while the excess seeds are disposed. The collected flour is distributed into industrial grade power mixers, where it is turned into wet flour, one of the key ingredients of the cake base. On the other side of the factory, chicken essence is being farmed. The essences are then ritualistically combined to create a 100% natural and organic chicken egg. Here, sugarcane is also being farmed and crushed down into sugar. The dough, eggs, and sugar are the essential ingredients of the cake base. All three are combined together in a basin, where they are then taken to Pound Town to form the perfect cake shape. This raw cake base is then transferred to a conveyor belt, where it rides through the nine layers of hell until it reaches its ideal summer tan. To finish the cake, frosting production begins with the unethical harvesting of cow milk. This milk then goes into a large tank, where it is pumped over to the frosting machine. This is where the cake is garnished with the frosting, and where the berries appear. Where the berries appear from is still a mystery. Finally, the cake is packaged into crates, where it will be delivered to local Kekimiris nearby. And that, folks, is how it's made. Now, I only needed to sit and let it work its magic. Get it? Magic? Because we're in a magic series and okay. And to pass the time, I brought my enchanting setup downstairs, collected my levels, and worked on some tools. As a builder, there are many tools I use in my day-to-day -day life, but none are as important as my pickaxe. Resource collecting is tasking, but a vital role in doing literally anything in this world, so having a good pick is almost always my priority. With that said, I enchanted myself a new pickaxe and sprinted to the mines in both the overworld and nether to celebrate. In the nether, I gathered enough netherite scrap to upgrade my pickaxe since I used all my other scrap to upgrade my backpack. Funny enough though, this netherite pick was not my ideal endgame tool, as I actually had my eye on something else. The only thing for me, after all, was a botanist tool. Botania's terra steel tools are pricey to make, but chock full of perks and silly stuff. Along with that, they have a sort of built-in mending that uses mana instead of experience. The terra shatterer alone is an amazing tool that when upgraded can break multiple blocks at once. The terra truncanator can fell trees in a single swoop, and the Terra Blade does damage on par with a netherite sword and can fire dangerous concentrated beams of mana. And I wanted them all combined together for my dream tool. Except, as I said, this would be pretty pricey to make. To craft all the tools takes a whopping 13 Terra Steel or 6.5 mana pools, but above all, I am a determined man with a newly established cake factory. I started making all the Terra Steel that I could, however, I immediately noticed my limited supply of Ender Pearls and therefore Mana Pearls. Endermen seemed few and far between in these parts, which meant I needed to get clever with my ender pearl hunt. At first, I merely wandered around the area of my house, but when that didn't yield good results, I headed to the nether. I did indeed find Endermen and another Bastion, just not the Endermen I expected. These Endermen were warped and disfigured, and their Ender Pearls reflected that. Unfortunately, the warped pearls could not be crafted into Mana Pearls, so I was once again thinking of other solutions. But hey, at least I got some fun loot from the Bastion. Back at home, I conjured up the idea to visit the village in search of a cleric to trade with. I grabbed my emeralds and traveled through the waystone to the village name that I will not attempt to pronounce. Flint. 
After asking around a bit, I learned this village did not have a cleric, so I had to walk to another one nearby. Luckily for me, this one had two. I traded with one until he was leveled up and bargained for 12 ender pearls. This village had its own waystone that I used to travel back to my home where I could continue my terra steel production. Even with the Kakamaris working at full efficiency, I continued to drain my mana supply with each terra steel ingot, so I started cycling my work. While I waited for my mana to replenish, I worked around the house, cooking for Winnie, landscaping the area, and gathering extra materials. Then, when I had sufficient mana, I'd create more terra steel. Eventually, I created all 13 terra steel and it was time to craft my tool. In the process, I got another achievement for arming myself with a terra blade. Side note, I did use an add-on here that adds a patini all-in-one tool. Uh, it, for me, it's just an inventory space thing. Also, I would just like to point out that with all five tools combined, this thing has an astonishing durability of 11,000. I sincerely don't think I've ever seen it that high, aside from unbreakable tools, and this was just one of the many aspects of this Terra tool. I mentioned the ability to upgrade Terra Shatterers, but I didn't have the opportunity to explain it. Terra Shatterers have a unique upgrade system in which imbuing the tool with mana increases the rank and therefore the amount of blocks it can break at once. The amount of mana required for each rank increases exponentially, starting off with just a little and then reaching terrifying demands of mana. To help you understand what I mean, I will be explaining the upgrades in cake terms. To upgrade to C tier, you would need less than a whole cake, about 6 out of the 7 slices. To upgrade to B tier, you would need a whole mana pool. Luckily, we've already established it's about 80 cakes to fill a mana pool. But here's where it gets interesting. For tier A, you need about 800 cakes. And then for S tier, you need 8,000 cakes. And last, for tier SS, you need a whopping 80,000 cakes. For my own sanity, I'm currently hoping that the cake is a lie. I mean, I don't have the intention of getting to SS tier anytime soon, but it is an interesting prospect for a future episode. For now though, with the mana I have, I was able to get my Terra tool to a lovely B tier, but I'm definitely not stopping there. With time and more cake, I hope to achieve at least A tier for this tool. After such a large accomplishment, I took a cute break and started sprucing at my greenhouse, since I did actually want it to look less like a factory and more like an ode to nature. At first, this meant adding little decorations like planters, benches and little tool racks, but then I started to think about my mystical flowers. I wanted them to be a more prominent part of the decor and use the cove under the stairs for more practical things. I started rearranging and arranging and rearranging again and it just wasn't working for me. It was at this point I decided I wanted to convert all of my excess flowers into petals and use the flowers simply as decoration. To do this, I started by creating small storage drawers for my little crafting corner. I absolutely adored this setup because the smaller storage drawers are so reminiscent of old-fashioned apothecary cabinets. To to turn all of my flowers into petals, I used my trusty manufactory halo, which plucked petals at a rate I could never achieve myself. Regardless of the help, this process still took quite some time, and about halfway through, I had to craft more mana pools to deal with the excess production of the Kekimuris. After I had successfully converted the flowers to petals, I began placing shelves and arranging the flowers around the greenhouse. Again, this was more for decoration than practicality, but if I ever did burn through my enormous petal supply, these pots do have an internal storage space. Once I was finally satisfied with all of that rearranging, I let my terror tools slurp up all of the mana I had collected and decided to enchant it. Step aside, Netherite Pickaxe. There is certainly a new guy in town and he is not playing around. I mean, seriously, this thing has the most ridiculous stats. Oh my god, I love breaking this game. Anyways, before I get too carried away, I want to show off my little apothecary corner. It's just so cute and also such a practical setup. I did notice though the cake crate was running a bit low, so I swapped it with the one in the factory just in case, and then I was free to do my own thing for a bit. Considering I just got a new tool, there wasn't much debate. I was going mining. Mining with this thing is so satisfying and terrifying at the same time. It eats my mana up for breakfast to repair itself, but cruises through stone like a dream. Truly, it is deserving of the name Terra Shatterer. While mining, I found myself running into more of those large dragon nests. The first one I encountered had a male dragon, like Winnie. After killing it and looting its nest, I found that I had to go back to my house for a bit to drop off supplies, since mining through all of this had really filled up my backpack. It was in the second trip down that I encountered a beautiful blue dragon, and also learned that I can shoot mana from my Terra tool, which I'm assuming is a characteristic taken from the Terra blade. This dragon was female, and I was kind of relieved when I noticed it dropped an egg. Don't get me wrong, I still feel terrible for killing these creatures, but I had long been thinking of finding a sibling for Winnie so that he would not be 
be so lonely up in his nest. However, considering how busy I was, I intended to keep this dragon egg safe until I was at a point where I could watch another rambunctious baby dragon again. Back at the house, chests were getting full and my organization was falling apart. It became very clear that my chest room needed some modifications. For resources I had an abundance of like ingots, I decided to switch to storage drawers. On top of this, I sectioned off my chest room into uses. First, I started with a little blacksmithing area. This cubby is where I keep my equipment, tools, metals, and apothesis gems, along with the associated workbenches. And then on the opposite side, I started making a wall for rocks and other prominent building supplies. Here, I put the work tables from chipped along with any other modded crafting benches. This setup was far from complete, but it was certainly a step in the right direction. It also took an ambitious amount of time, which is great news for my building mana supply. Aside from upgrading my Terra tool, I wanted to craft a matching set of armor. Terra steel armor isn't mandatory for completing this mod, however, it would certainly be helpful for completing future achievements. To do this, I'd need a boatload of mana, along with iron, diamonds, and ender pearls. To get more ender pearls, I made a trip back to the village to trade with my cleric friend and then promptly kidnapped him. Now, I don't do villager trades that much, even in the more vanilla realms I've been in, so I had this very dense moment of wondering why he wouldn't trade with me when he didn't have a workstation. Don't worry guys, I figured it out eventually. While I was foolishly waiting for him to restock, I began decorating my dining room of all places. I thought it was amusing that I built a table for like six people when it was just in fact me. Um, I'm definitely not lonely guys and on a completely unrelated note, do you think they make dining room chairs for 50 foot long dragons? When I did eventually figure out why the cleric wasn't trading with me, I finally fixed it and got the ender pearls I needed. Now I could get on with crafting that terra steel armor. The first step was to create the 12 terra steel ingots. Terra steel armor isn't crafted in the way you might normally craft armor, instead it works more like an upgrade to mono steel armor. Each piece of armor requires three terra steel and one of four seasonal runes, which I also needed to craft. Fortunately for me, I had the materials for these already so it was a breeze. Winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And with that, I had a full set of terra steel. As I mentioned before, full sets of armor in Botania come with perks, and in this case I get a reduction of the cost of mana related tools, like my terra tool. However, enchanting this armor set was going to be a slow process, since I needed about 60 levels per piece of armor. I enchanted the chest plate first, and then to gain some levels quicker, I went mining and used those levels to enchant my helmet. Instead of going back to the mines for the other half, I realized it would be best to let the experience plant do its thing and use my time to continue Botania's achievements. After all, I still had three achievements on that fourth set. The first of which was to create and fire a mana blaster. The mana blaster simply fires mana bursts. While shaped like a pistol for easy handling, it's not so much a firearm as it is a portable mana spreader. By drawing mana from mana carrying items in the holder's inventory, it fires mana bursts from the wielder's current position and bearing. These bursts differ slightly from the ones fired from spreaders. They travel faster, but carry only three quarters of the mana a spreader's burst would. The blaster also has a short cooldown after firing before it can shoot again. Mana lenses function in conjunction with the blaster. To attach one to a blaster, craft them together in a crafting table. To remove the lens, simply place the mana blaster back on the crafting grid. A haste effect on a wielder decreases the blaster's cooldown time. It's an easy craft, only requiring a basic mana rune, a mana spreader, and some TNT. Of course, I actually needed mana to fire it, so I loaded up my tablet, and that morning as the sun rose, I fired my mana blaster and got the achievement. I hardly have any use for this at the moment, but I just adore the model so much, and though the lexicon states it's not a weapon, I still felt like a wizard cowboy with this thing. I love my Hoshi, and my Hoshi love me. The next achievement I focused on was crafting a rod of dirt, or a uh, lance, I suppose. This is one of the many silly rods within Botania, but it's helpful for a landscaper like me. After crafting it with an earth rune, a living wood stick, and some dirt, I now had a wand that made dirt out of thin air, or technically speaking, mana. This actually made me super excited for future landscaping because although I had plenty of dirt to take from, it wasn't exactly convenient to move it around the grounds. My last achievement in this row was to use a botanical brewery. My last achievement in this row was to use a botanical brewery. Now, I'll say this is again where I really enjoyed following the achievement path, as despite working with Botania before, I've never used this. First, I crafted the special brewery, and then I decided on what potion I wanted to make. You could really tell I had no clue what I was doing because I put the ingredients in and waited as nothing happened, because of course, like everything else, it needs mana. After moving it to a spreader and re-adding the materials, I watched as it quickly brewed a 
Vial of Restoration, and I got my achievement, which officially completed row four of the achievement list. Now, I was entering a more dangerous stage of achievements, ones that would require me to get my hands dirty with various bosses and enter the late stages of Botania and the game. But of course, before that, I have to finish decorating my dining room. Look, I've got this giant house and nothing inside of it. I mean, my bedroom is kind of this sad little bed in a giant room. Anyways, I was doing this while I was actually being interviewed, and if that interview is out, I'll leave the link in the description below. It was pretty fun and also a great way to get to know more about me. Hellfire and I dove into a lot of topics about Minecraft and myself. Also, on another happy note, during this time, I was able to get my Terra tool to rank A, so yay! Before we dive into the final act of Botania, I want to discuss one other entry that appeared in the Alphamancy section of my lexicon, because despite the author of it claiming, This entry appears to be a set of papers torn out of an Elden Guard tome. While it may prove useful for learning about history, it's doubtful that it will provide any insight into the study of botany. I think it provides fun context for a lot of the loot, bosses, and history of this world, as well as some evidence for the mythos Botania draws from. It has been a millennia since the event known as the Shattering tore the worlds asunder. Very few know the truth of what happened on that day, and this account seeks to remedy that. It began when Nido Valir was struck by an earthquake that collapsed the majority of the realm. While the dwarves' incredible strength and durability allowed them to survive and preserve certain things, most of their technology and culture was lost to the void between worlds. This disturbance caused Muspelheim to break free from its tether on the World Tree herself. It crashed into the far realm of Midgard, fusing with it in a storm of fire that left no life remaining there. Many of us believe that the goddess Hel had a hand in Muspelheim's fall, but no concrete evidence was ever found. The quakes managed to reach Jotunheim, cracking the earth and massacring the giants. We do not know whether they have truly died out, but the giants have not resurfaced since. Niflheim remained perfectly still, despite Muspelheim's fall a major factor in the theories about Hell. However, since it contains no known life besides the goddess herself, we are unworried about any damage occurred there. We of Alfheim were dealt a great blow, but some worse than others. As the Salamander and Undyne clans depend greatly on their respective volcanic and aquatic environments, the disruption of those environments decimated the population. Conversely, the Self, being a nomadic clan who preferred the sky to the land, remained largely unscathed. Their cousins, the Spriggan, nomads as well, were also able to survive, relatively intact. Our self-emissary to Asgard, Alwyn, witnessed the beginning of it all, Thor turning Mjolnir upon the Bifrost, shattering it. Her command to evacuate our entire Midgardian population saved thousands of lives. Although, she seemed outwardly unharmed as she arrived on the crest of a wave of crumbling Bifrost to warn us, the toll of the journey caused her to pass away shortly after. What concerns us now is the state of Midgard. As the Bifrost can no longer give us access to that world, we cannot observe it directly. However, the mana left behind as we fled surely has brought about new life, as it always does. Whether it be animal, floral, or fungal, and whether it be natural or magical in nature, we hope that life will be intelligent enough to harness what we have left behind. Um, that's uh, a lot. If this sounds like a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo, don't worry, I'll explain. If it sounds familiar though, congratulations, I diagnose you with nerd. Luckily, I have the perfect book in my library to help us work through this entry, discerning what comes from Norse mythos and what it adds. Let's start with the word Nithabetlir. This is directly one of the nine realms connected to the tree of Yggdrasil. Same with the other realms mentioned, Muspelheim, Alfheim, and Midgard. Midgard being the most important because that's the human realm. Here. The entry speaks of a great shattering, an event in which the connection between the realms and the world tree is destroyed. And there is definitely a real myth parallel to this, one I'd expect most people to recognize due to the Norse mythos injected into the Marvel Universe. That's right folks, I'm talking about Ragnarok. Like any mythos, there are multiple variations, interpretations, you get it, but in the version I own, the tale follows a very similar thread of events. Yggdrasil begins to tremble, the world begins to fall apart, leading to bloody wars across the realm. I won't read it all, but I will read you this excerpt. The Aesir world was plunged into darkness, and Yggdrasil, the world tree, broke and fell. Surt lifted his flaming sword and flung fire over everything. The sea rose above the mountains and fell crashing over the land. The air trembled, the stars were ripped from the sky as burning earth disappeared under the waves, and the sacred halls of Asgard toppled and fell. Out of the depths rose Nidhogg, the dragon of destruction. For a while it hovered over the fallen world and then sank back into the void. 
So obviously similar, especially with the ending that Midgard was to start anew. This likely serves as an in-game explanation as to why I find myself alone in this particular realm, but I can't say that offers much comfort. Instead, it acts as more of a confirmation that this exists in a timeline without others. With that said, at least I have the company of my studies, am I right? Now, with my lovely dining room complete, it was time to get back to my achievement hunt, and the next one was particularly important as I would be summoning and fighting the Guardian of Gaia. The Guardian of Gaia, or the Gog as I like to call it, is a late game boss designed to be fought in between the Wither and before the Ender Dragon. The lexicon says, The ritual of Gaia is a trial often undertaken by elves. It yields Gaia spirits, which are coveted as fragments of the power of the goddess of Gaia herself. This ritual requires an active beacon with Gaia pylons surrounding it, functioning as an altar, as well as a single terrestrial ingot as a sacrifice. Considering I will need a beacon, I don't really have a choice in fighting the Wither first, so we need to accomplish that. Thanks to my various trips to the Nether and my looting three halberd, I actually already had three Wither Skulls, so I enchanted my pants and prepared to summon it before quickly realizing I had no soul sand. One trip to the Nether later, and I was taking the ladder down to my mines to summon the Wither. This fight was certainly easier than my other Wither fights. The Terra Steel armor ended up being the perfect armor for this since it had a natural knockback resistance. As the Wither fell, I received the load of loot and an increased knowledge on death. Interesting, we're gonna need to put a pin in that. For a moment though, I thought I hadn't received another star, but my backpack had just picked it up first. I immediately consumed the heart containers I got and climbed back to my house. The Gog ritual requires a very specific setup with a beacon, Gaia pylons, and a circular area free of any obstructions. First, I crafted the beacon and then started on the Gaia pylons. To make these, I was going to need some materials from trading with the elves, and in general, my supply of alpine base materials was running low. Hence, I prepared a lot of supplies to trade. Once I had crafted my pylons, it was a matter of deciding where I wanted to put my setup. I could have put it directly next to the greenhouse, but I wasn't sure there would be enough space, and I wanted to eventually build a garden around it. Unlike most boss fights, the Gog isn't really a one and done, since it has two variations of the fight. The first being the one mentioned before and the one needed for the achievement, and the second being an additional challenge to summon the Guardian with more speed, strength, and resistance, for the reward of quote, a handful of goodies and rare treasure, of which I have my speculations on. The same section of the lexicon discusses these relics of Azir, which the elves dismiss as fictitious, but I have a feeling that my elven friends are wrong, and I'm going to prove it. I eventually picked a spot right about where I previously had the enchanting table and began to plan out my circle. Once you start the ritual, you are locked within a barrier, and sometimes the particles are not super clear, so it's best to mark out the area on the ground as well. Once that was complete, I began to set up the rest of the ritual. First, the beacon goes in the center, and then from each corner, I walked out and placed the Gaia pylons. Now, all I need to do to activate the ritual was push a terrestrial ingot into the beacon. Without much preparation, I decided to fight the Guardian of Gaia. I pushed the terrestrial ingot into the beacon, and from it rose a figure that was... me? Before I could really process it, the Guardian began to rapidly teleport around the circle, while as areas of withering effect shifted around the ground. At first, I tried to melee the Guardian, but soon switched to my bow. When she dropped below two-thirds of health, the next stage began, and the Guardian spirit rose above, spotting hordes of monsters. Only when I had defeated them did it return to the ground, teleporting faster than before. But only a few hits were needed before she fell, and I received the achievement Hide and Seek. I counted up the loot I got, which honestly wasn't much, and prepared for the next variation of this fight. To summon the Greater Guardian, I'd need to combine Gaia Spirits and Terra Steel, two of the strongest crafting ingredients in this mod. I crafted two Terra Steel and combined them with all eight Gaia Spirits I received to create two Gaia Ingots. Surprisingly, the second fight did not give me much issue, at first. Despite the higher strength, damage, and resistance, I found myself completing the ritual in a matter of minutes. There was so much loot, I could hardly fit it in my pocket. So I deposited it all in a nearby chest, and that was when I noticed the dice just waiting there for me. He's just standing there, menacingly! This object was odd. It was immune to my magnet ring, to anything really, so I picked it up and I rolled it. Within my hands was a small apple named the Fruit of Grisaya. This was clearly one of the relics of Azir, a gift from the gods, and it was bound to my soul. It came with a sense of familiarity, like I knew what it was and what it did. So this time, I opened my lexicon, and I added the following entry. 
The relic known as the fruit of Grisaya bestows the brave soul who earned it with an endless supply of nourishment. It can be eaten like any other piece of food, but will use mana to replenish hunger instead. So the elves were indeed wrong, and the relics of Azir really truly existed within the Dice of Fate, which also meant that there must be more. Let's go gambling! I approached the beacon again, taking another Gaia ingot and starting the ritual, and thus began the first of many days. Well, the Gaia locked me in the circle during the ritual, in many ways I had locked in myself, repeating and rehashing the same ritual again and again. This, of course, is matched by the irony that the Guardian itself appears as the player, as me, leading me to ponder the relationship between Gaia and the player. The word Gaia and a mention of a goddess particularly piqued my interest because unlike most of Batania's mythos so far, this isn't Norse. Gaia is the Greek word for the personification of Earth, which is certainly not exclusive to Greek mythology. The mere idea of a feminine nature goddess is one that has persisted throughout the world, even as it veered away from paganism and other folk religion. For example, Percatio Terematris, incantation of the Mother of Earth, was a prayer often found in association with old European herbals, usually combined together in Codis. In the Romantic era, the concept survived predominantly in literary works like poems. Popular English poet Percy Shelley introduced Proserpine as her daughter when he wrote, Sacred goddess, mother earth, thou from whose immortal bosom gods and men and beasts have birth. Leaf and blade and bud and blossom, breathe thine influence most divine on thy own child, Proserpine. Nowadays, mother nature or feminine nature goddess still prevails throughout pop culture, especially with the rise of environmentalism. From children's cartoons, to movies, to video games, to literally the mod I'm playing. Which brings me back around to my initial thought. In this world, what is the player's role in all this? The connection between the botanists and Gaia? The Lexica Batania offers no further details regarding Gaia or the Guardian, so I'm gonna share my own theory. I don't think the Guardian is an enemy, a beast that you kill or defeat, but rather a test, where the player must face a version of themselves, a Guardian, to prove that they are capable of being a Guardian themselves, that they are deserving of Gaia's spirit. To me, this fits thematically with everything we've learned about Batania so far. It's a nature-themed mod that focuses on the various natural energies around us, and it clearly has a respect for nature, for Gaia, so of course its boss is not actually a boss, but rather an initiation to become a Guardian yourself. But the second guardian to me is where things take a turn. The second guardian is summoned not through Terrasteel, but through a Gaia ingot, the combination of Terrasteel and the very thing credited to be a fraction of Gaia's power. It's only through this battle that the player receives relics from other gods for their victory. And I must add that the Dice of Fate has six sides, six relics to obtain, each one requiring its own ritual. This addition to the ritual to me changes the tone a bit. No longer are you proving yourself a guardian, but you're proving yourself worthy of divine power. If defeating the guardian makes you a guardian, then defeating the guardian with the spirit of a goddess must also make you so. At first glance, it seems great, climbing the way to godhood, each ritual a rung in the ladder, but when it comes to any god-given power within myths, I find myself wary for one reason, hubris. The excessive pride of the tragic hero. Could I really see myself as the guardian of Gaia if I was battling her own spirit? And is the power of the gods worth it if I have to destroy myself over and over? Do I even want it at all? I stayed in that circle for days, hashing the same ritual again and again, anticipating the final roll of the dice, until I went to put away my loot after another battle and realized I had no space. In front of me sat several chests full of runes, relics, the spoils of my labors, and the severed heads of the guardian, my own skin staring back at me. I was tired, and it had all. I'd forgotten the achievements, the cake, the whole point of it all. And I decided that I was done with this, not the whole video. It was time to get back to my botanical studies, to the achievements, to Winnie. After all, I have the materials now to continue. And in my heart, I knew exactly what achievement I wanted to focus on next. And so I began to convert my under pearls to under eyes. I emptied my backpack as much as I could and I created a waystone to bring with me. For I had no clue how far I'd need to travel, only that I was going to the end. 
You see, Gaia spirits are some of the highest tier crafting ingredients in Batania, but usually you'll find it paired with another, the bottled air of the end dimension. In order to truly master botanical magic, I'd need to acquire this ingredient as it relates to four separate achievements. Ready as I could be, I stepped outside with my ender eyes, tossed the first one into the air, and began to follow the path ahead. I traveled over the mountains and to the edge of a cliff where I built a boat. Already a thousand blocks from home, I sailed into a glacial area. The the pitch black sea offered little visibility, and I grew anxious of the creatures below, but it hardly mattered when I heard a song, something calling to me from within the glaciers, and I felt myself carried forward. But the little senses I had knew it was a trick, and I quickly shot the siren before it could do any harm. To regather myself, I sailed to a nearby ice patch and destroyed my boat. And without much pause, the water began to shift underneath, and my map displayed a wiggling creature the length of the ice. But again, I could not see anything in the black waters. So I put on my night vision goggles only to reveal a serpent. I drew my bow and shot at it, quickly killing it. And only then could I actually rest. Clearly, I was in dangerous territory, and I needed to keep my wits about me and my eyes on the water. I still had a long way to go. While I was traveling, I started to think about the significance of the Ender Dragon in the eyes of Batania. For I recalled that passage in the myth of Ragnarok that the Shattering was based on. Out of the depths rode Nidhogg, the dragon of destruction. For a while it hovered over the fallen world and then sank back into the void. I couldn't help but wonder if the Ender Dragon in this world was akin to Nidhogg, if it was possibly the reason for the Shattering of the Realms and thus its destruction. Obviously the Ender Dragon is its own thing, born separate of Batania, but the possibility of a connection is really fascinating. I continued to travel the path of the pearls, and while I did encounter more serpents, none of them came close to the size of the first one. However, that doesn't mean they didn't give me a good scare. They can just jump out of the water, which is certainly terrifying. By the next day, I had reached another piece of land, and the hunt continued. I will note, um, I kept thinking my ender eyes were breaking, but they were actually just going into my backpack. It caused quite the panic for me. For the first time since I started traveling, I threw my ender pearl and it flew over my shoulder and back. Clearly I was near it, or even at the center. I activated my terror tool and began to dig straight down, falling directly into the main room. The structure turned out to be a large maze of many rooms and chests. And before I even found the end portal, I found myself needing to take a trip back to drop off the loot. So I placed the waystone and traveled back home. After carrying loot back and forth between my home and the stronghold, I finally decided to search for the portal room. When I came upon it, I placed the waystone down aside it and began meticulously placing the ender pearls in their slots. Hesitantly, I jumped into the portal and I- Wait. <laughs> I crashed. Something kind of weird happened with the crash where it set me back a little bit, and when I came back, I didn't have my andesite or my ender bottles. However, at least this time I was able to actually go through the portal. I just didn't have any blocks to bridge across, so it's barrel time. I made it to the main island, surprised to find a strange structure and a bell ringing out. What attacked me though was not what I expected. Instead of normal endermen, there was these ravenous, twisted versions with their mouths agape and they were immediately hostile without even catching my gaze. It was certainly a problem since I was supposed to be focusing on the dragon. Soon, I was surrounded by Endermen, suffocated by their screams until I fought them off. I did not want anything to do with these guys, and as soon as I could, I booked it at the side of one of the obsidian pylons. A few crystals I was able to take out with my bow, but some were trickier than others. I used my enderpearls to get from one to the next until I saw one I couldn't quite reach. After towering high up, I destroyed each end crystal and began to shift my focus to the dragon. It's so strange how this fight feels completely different with the perspective of everything I've gone through. Fighting dragons after dragon above ground, the wither, even fighting a version of myself over and over again, just to prepare for this moment that ended swiftly with a few arrows. As the dragon lit up the sky, I teleported down and collected the XP and loot. Of course, it was only at this moment that I realized I had none of the glass bottles I needed, so I foolishly had to make a trip back. But I had done it. I had collected my Ender Air. And though there may have been several achievements ahead of it, I knew exactly what I wanted to craft. For one of my favorite items in Botania is the Flugel Tiara. This is more than just a bobble. It's wings, and honestly one of the most balanced survival flying systems I've encountered. With it, I can fly at the cost of mana and my own stamina, which does have to rebuild over time. And the extra fun part is the variety of wings you have. But of course, me being me, I had something else in mind. I took a second to ask myself. 
what if I had wings? What kind would they be and what would they look like? And I already knew the answer. So instead of using the Batania design for wings, I loaded up Armorer's Workshop and decided to make my own, completely inspired off of a buck moth. Buck moths are insects found in oak forests on the eastern side of the United States, and I chose them for their habitat and because of their name. Buck often refers to a deer, and deer are something that I love. Deer have a variety of symbolisms in culture, normally attached to peace, intelligence, and the ability to journey. And the animal certainly has its connections with modern and ancient Druidry, especially the kind derived from Celtic roots. In Celtic mythology, deer are fairy creatures with the ability to pass between realms. And often in the stories, you'll see figures transform into deer in order to flee from their hunters. I just find it to be a lovely and graceful animal and very fitting of the design of my character. And the second I put them on, I knew I was right and it felt like the perfect reward for all that I had achieved. Which, speaking of achievements, we still have a few. I know, but before we get to them, I have some stuff I want to do first. For starters, I wanted my greenhouse to finally look like a greenhouse, and I needed a more efficient way of storing mana. Considering it's what I use to repair my armor and weapons, I think it's good to have a supply on hand, and who knows, maybe one day I'll have that S plus tier tool. Anyways, I started by gutting the greenhouse a bit, and then trying to figure out how I wanted to arrange this. I came up with this idea of some kind of stacking mana pools that eventually lead underground where mass storage would begin. I also prepared to make some higher tier mana spreaders because I wanted one for every mana pool. I also wanted to make a couple more Kekamuras. Eventually, I decided on this design where my Kekamuras were still out in the open, but integrated into the design of the garden to look like actual flowers. Then I began to build a workshop underneath the room, and ultimately this is what I came up with. I crafted some additional Kekamuras totaling to about six plants. Within the appropriate radius of all of them, the deployer places the cake as needed, and four Gaia spiders push the mana into two different towers of mana pools. These stack all the way into the basement below, and from here, the mana is divided into different sections for storage. And I keep my altar down here as well. This is just the start of what I plan to do, since I also wanted to decorate my greenhouse. If I was going to sit here and call myself a proper botanist, I needed a place that reflected that. I wanted a place full of flora and fauna from all around, so I decided to go through the end waystone and travel above ground in search of unique plants. Wait, pause. By this point, I had been recording for dozens of hours and my game kept crashing and I took breaks. I'm not the best about remembering to press record after and for that, I apologize. I did create myself a new bow, which is what you see right here and why my levels went down drastically. Anyways, unpause. Instead of some lovely flowers, I unfortunately found some malicious pixies that tried taking my stuff. So you know what? I took their house and ran away before they could snatch anything more of importance. This is the first time I was able to fly during my adventures, and it was certainly handy since I could spend a lot of time above the trees and away from whatever creatures lurked on the forest floor. But as I said, I do have a flying stamina limit, so every now and then I'd land to rebuild it and check out the surrounding area. At one point, I found a really cool wizard's house, which surprise surprise did contain a wizard, and these really aggressive birds that shot their daggered feathers at me. I didn't get much sleep due to these things, but by morning I was on my way, itching to get out of this swamp with its strange birds and wizard men. When I did finally break free from the swamp, as a warm, or shall I say icy welcome, I was attacked by another dragon. You know, I didn't like sign up to be the dragonborn, like, I'm kind of trying to do this whole druid thing, and everyone's just messing with my style. In a more positive light, I found this really pretty meadow with all kinds of flowers, and oh my god, is that another dragon? Anyways, flowers. Yeah. With everything I needed to decorate my house, I headed home, except I didn't bring a waystone with me, so I was a little stuck, and it was quickly turning night. I began my journey back when I noticed a village off in the distance, and I hoped that maybe they would have a waystone. However, when I arrived, something else had caught my eye, a goddess statue, and uh, you're coming home with me. Since I was already here, I thought I might as well check out a few of the chests and take a little nap. Except I awoke to this aggressive pelting noise and I saw this poor iron golem being mauled by those birds. So now I was tasked with going around the village and killing these annoying pests. I mean, they did let me stay the night and it was just some odd birds after all and oh hey it's a hydra! Wait. Oh my god, this is getting so out of hand. You know, I was really hoping to just enjoy some nice flower picking and a cute walk while I chilled out after my heroic adventures, but here we are, I guess. I started with my bow, but switched to my terror tool until I noticed the Hydra's health was rapidly increasing and was continuing to grow more heads. It was only when I shot at it with a flame bow that the creature was unable to regenerate, and I soon fell at getting the achievement the 12 labors of Hercules. Which, I mean, hey, I'll, I'll take that comparison. I mean, look at the dude's thighs. 
Hercules. Just as I was finally on my way out, I heard a cute meow in the distance and I spotted this adorable little orange cat. It reminded me so much of my own little creature. I decided it was also coming home with me. This village did have a waystone, thankfully, and I was able to travel back with my new flowers, new materials, and a new friend. As soon as I arrived home, it was back to decorating the greenhouse, but this time it was pure fun. I sheared nearby trees and hung leaves from the ceiling. I strung up potted plants and lights. I even dug a small stream throughout the greenhouse, allowing it to be taken fully by natural beauty. But I realized I could not just stop there, as I remembered the Alfheim portal just outside the greenhouse, and I wanted that too to be decorated in a fitting manner. I don't particularly enjoy building custom trees in survival, but I thought nesting the portal in a giant tree would fit the themes of Yggdrasil's branches connecting my realm to the elves. And I suppose I always really appreciated the iconography of trees across all cultures, or even just as a map for the evolution of life. Before I could really build in Minecraft, I used to grow a mass of spruce trees together and carve out the interior for a home. These homes were not my best builds for sure, but little me thought I was genius for it. Alongside the tree, I focused on some ambience in the surrounding area, bringing the floor outside of the greenhouse. I also built a small gazebo for that goddess statue I acquired from the village, and I finally traded in my spirit orbs for a massive lump sum of health. When I completed the area, I decided it was finally time to complete my achievement hunt. I was on the home stretch after all, a mere few away from completing my goal, and most of it was just crafting. I started with the easiest, for there was this collection of flowers I had yet to craft, both of which were functional flowers. The first was the Babel. This flower creates a pocket of air and water and is perfect for creating an underwater base. And second, there is Heisei Dreams, a flower that causes hostile mobs to turn against each other in rage. These two flowers mark the completion of my second to last row. Since I was already hanging out in my apothecary corner, I decided to jump to craft in the Dandiflipion. Dandif- Dandif- Dan? De Lithion. Dan de Lithion. Okay. This beautifully annoying flower, where do I even begin? The dandelion is one of the most complicated and fascinating generating flowers in Botania because it uses John Conaway's cellular life automation game of life as a way of producing mana. Despite the fact that this four rule game seems simple, it's a lot more complicated to explain, especially since Botania takes what was originally a 2D game into the third dimension and adds its own rules. I'd like to try this flower out someday, but at the moment it seems like an experiment, and so for efficiency's sake, I moved on to the next achievement, crafting and using a life aggravator. In regards to the life aggravator, the lexicon reads, when a dragon stone, elementium, ender air, and Gaia spirits love each other very much, are crafted in a specific pattern, they yield a device that can restrain the curious energies of a monster spawner and carry it to another point in space. Unfortunately, the device will shatter after being used once. That last part I was clearly unaware of because after traveling back to the stronghold, capturing the spawner and getting my achievement, I just placed it on the ground in my yard, expecting that I would be able to pick it back up. I think I could say with certainty that this mastery was wearing me down, but I was determined to complete the achievements in any case. The next down the list was to create a Mana Storm Charge, which from what I could tell was essentially a Mana Bomb, its power coming from the combination of a Gaia Spirit and TNT. I got the achievement the second I crafted it, however my curiosity was, well, let's just say I wanted to know how much damage it could actually do. I didn't want to destroy any of the landscape around me, so I took my bomb down to the mines and placed it at the epicenter of the ancient city. I ignited the bomb, sat back, and watched. My bomb rating, I'd say 5 out of 10. It didn't do as much damage as I expected, but it made it for a very pretty light show. Now folks, we move on to our second to last achievement, crafting some luminizers. Luminizers simply transport players and other entities by flying them through the air on trails of light. Luminizers are placed in the world as blocks and function when bound to other luminizers with a wand of the forest. Right-clicking a luminizer will transport its user to the luminizer it's bound to. Luminizers have a range of 20 blocks each but can be changed together to create quite long and complex paths. Again, I got the achievement the second I crafted it, so that was a lie. But I wanted to at least try the luminizers out because I had a genuine interest in using them for transportation. I went to an empty room in my house, setting them up a few blocks apart, connecting them in an endless loop, and then I watched as my character was thrown back and forth and back and forth. The sound effects are so silly, it's literally just a woo. 
I loved it, and I knew I wanted to build some kind of transport with them, I just wasn't sure where. In the meanwhile though, I thought I should complete my last achievement, Packet Hero. This relates to one of Botania's prime and gain systems, called the Corporea Network. This is where the complicated nature of Botania and its no GUI design really come into play. As the Corporea Network acts as an item transportation system with not an interactable GUI in sight. To quote, the corporea system uses the energy of the end and the void between worlds to transport items from point A to point B instantly without intervening blocks. The system, at its core, uses variant sparks, called corporea sparks, that transport items instead of mana. Now this is where I inject my personal opinion of I don't really like this. I am a visual, visual guy, and while Botania has aids to make the corporeal network visual, it's just not really my cup of tea. But alas, I still have to get the achievement, so I do have to craft something. With the completion of this craft, I had officially accomplished all 33 achievements of Botania, and whew, what a journey. And still, I felt as though I'd only touched the surface of what this mod could do. Oh, this is not necessary. Later. That I'd barely progress, but that's the interesting part about slow progression, at least in my case. Sometimes when progression is slow, it's really hard to gauge how much progress has been made, so let's walk it back. Oh, I paused it. When I started this video, I had no botanical experience in this realm, a baby dragon, and an empty field. And now I sit with 33 accomplishments, multiple boss fights complete, a large dragon in my own greenhouse. But on top of this, I have had to explore the craft of Botania itself and the beautiful connections to our real world. When I started this journey of progressing through these mods, I didn't really know what to expect in terms of craftsmanship or lore, but Botania has already blown it out of the park for me. While studying this mod in game, it led me on my own kind of mastery journey in real life as I read about ancient and modern druidry and paganism across Europe. This dual learning really garnered an appreciation for both subjects and the way in which our real world leaks into our digital realms. And Although I only shared a small fraction of what I learned, I hope that you too share this appreciation. Overall, I think it just made me excited to continue. Whilst playing Batania throughout this video, I was able to get a glimpse into many of the other magic mods available to me, and once again, I felt as though it was only the end of the beginning. To really dig my heels into this moment, I decided to finally grab that blue dragon egg I collected all that time ago and place it in the waters of my greenhouse to hatch. Just like last time, the dragon egg shook and cracked open to reveal a beautiful blue ice dragon. I flew it over to Winnie, showing my once baby boy his new friend, and I took the baby dragon with me and for the first time since starting this episode, I sat down and finally enjoyed a meal. Not worrying about cake or mana or the next achievement I must accomplish. For once, I truly had the ability to take a break and do what I wanted. So I took a nighttime stroll, finding myself upon the top of my greenhouse as the stars twinkled and auroras danced along the skyline. And I wished for something between me and the stars, that wherever I go next in my magical journey, it is as equally satisfying as the last. Finally, I retrieved my new baby dragon and I crept down to the depths of my chest room, staring at the hordes of unorganized loot, and I decided to get to work, finishing an episode once again with a baby dragon in an unorganized chest room. But although I found myself in the exact same spot I started, I knew I was entirely new and suddenly less alone. I'm sorry, is someone at the door? Yeah, yeah, I'm on my way. Hello? Is there something I can help you with? Hi. Okay, we got some credits, we got some thank yous. First off, I'd like to thank you, the viewer, for watching, especially to this point, or if you're gonna continue watching to the end. You're iconic, you're amazing, you're a stunner. Anyways, I'd also really like to thank my patrons because holy cow, they supported me so much throughout this project. Um, I was not super able to post a lot or do like, you know, build requests and updates and stuff like that because I was so engrossed with this video and so focused on it and then also dealing with some life stuff. So if you supported me within the past few months on Patreon, thank you so much. You're a, you're, you're awesome. Um, I would also really like to thank Vazki and the Moonlight team for their work on Botania. I first played this mod in 
1.7.10 and it was the first magic tech mod I ever tried and I think it will forever be my favorite. I'd also like to thank Sarah Simons for doing the voiceover for the elf section and Proton Pixie for the lore reading section. And as always, I'd like to give a huge thank you and shout out to Bones, my editor. Um, not only did they edit this video, but they voice acted. Um, they also supported me through the ups and downs of creating this. Um, and they're also such an amazing life partner. Academically, I'd like to thank Ronald Hutton. He wrote two fantastic books that were wonderful resources for this video and for me. As I delve into researching Druidry, a lot of people accredited him and mentioned him and mentioned his work. He seems like a really prominent figure in the community. So I definitely think that he's worth checking out. Um, and yeah, I suppose that's it. As far as other content goes, I'm working on three separate videos for the next quarter. The next installment of Mastering magic will likely be out for Halloween. So sorry guys for the wait. In the meanwhile, I have a Chisel and Bits video coming out soon, um, along with another special educational project. Um, thank you guys so much for the support, and uh, yeah, bye! <laughs>